Hello, my name is Trinity and I'm a Kiwi living in Norway, a Māori Viking, if you will. And I'm currently in the candidacy process for eldership at Sunnerfjord Evangeliska Manihat, or an English Sunnerfjord Evangelical Church. Uh, we have two elders at the moment. You've heard from one, uh, Pastor Arland, uh, during this conference. And we split the preaching between us most of the, most of the time, uh, between us three. And I preach mostly in English, so feel free to check out our YouTube channel if you would like. Subscribing to our YouTube channel uh, will help us out since we're a new church plant. We uh, planted in February. And I have been personally blessed by the friendship of Nahum and his wife. And it's hard to believe that one year ago, uh, I was throwing the old pigskin around with him here in Norway, and I was considering wearing uh, this uh, t-shirt uh, today while giving the message, uh, but uh, I don't think uh, Nahum would appreciate the intention I'm giving him uh, if I wore that. But I must say, Nahum, my brother in thunder, called this because of our loud voices and no other reason, of course. I'm so thankful for you. I'm so thankful for what you've done for Norway. And I miss you, brother. I miss you. I'm praying for you. And your guitar is getting played a lot at our church now. And my youngest boy, Jonah, still speaks of name harm. <laughs> and just a week ago, he won once again, he asked where you are. And so you are loved and missed by us all. And to all the people who contributed to this conference, I'm overwhelmed by your faithfulness and your love for us here in the Nordic countries. Oh, how desperate we are for faithful teaching, uh, for faithful elders, and for faithful churches. Please don't stop praying for us here in Norway. We, we need it. We need it desperately. The question I want to address today is, how can a young man, a young woman, keep their way pure. Generation Z, those who are born in between 1997 and 2012, these are 10 to 25 years old, uh, year olds. And 40% of them spend three hours a day on TikTok. And on top of that, around the same percent, 40% of 10 to 25 year olds spend more than three hours a day on YouTube. And I'm not sure how much you've seen or read about TikTok, but it's definitely not a place where purity is a priority. Uh, there have been direct correlations between social media use and anxiety and depression. And the algorithms are winning. They keep kids and adults hooked for hours a day. They check your search history, uh, what videos you have watched, and then they aim to keep your attention. You don't even need to click on a video this, as the social media algorithms see how long you stop on a Facebook post or an Instagram ad and they aim to feed you similar content. Then something comes up, something that piques an interest, something that most definitely will not lead to pure thoughts. And then they go down a rabbit hole, clicking recommended videos over and over. And soon they're hooked and a video comes up and it produces excitement and interest and even lust and passion. And one click, and the algorithm knows this is what you're interested in. And it is at this specific time of day that you're interested in this specific type of media. And so what happens is that after three to six hours a day watching favorite YouTubers and TikTok influencers, uh, one begins to think about the videos and think about the content creators who made these videos. We think of them and we remember them and we're taught by them and we speak of them and we rejoice them. We share them with our friends and we value them and we meditate on them and we delight in them and we do not forget them. And if adults are not immune to this, then children do not stand a chance. And I know they don't stand a chance. I know this firsthand by being a teacher to eight to 12 years old students. That's my job. I teach digital media to this age. I get paid to do this. And these are not apps made to train up a child in the way they should go. These apps that determine one's attention and more often than not suck the life and strength out of the pursuit of purity. And although we may ask the right questions, the answers are either far from us or undesirable. 
How can a young person keep their way pure? How can a young man full of hot passion, who is poor in knowledge and experience, how can he get right and keep right? How can a young woman surrounded in pictures and videos saying that external beauty is what makes one valuable? How can she keep her conduct pure in a world that values her impurity? How can parents support children who want to choose a path to purity but do not know where to start? So I asked, how can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to his word. With my whole heart I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. I have stored your word up in my heart that I might not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. With my lips I declare all the rules of your mouth and the ways of your testimonies. I delight as much as in all riches. I will meditate on your precepts. Fix my eyes on your ways. I will delight in your statutes. I will not forget your word. Charles Spurgeon says it like this. The way or life of the man has to be cleansed from the sins of his youth behind him and keep clear of the sins which temptation will place before him. This is the work. This is the difficulty. This is the greatest ambition that a young person can have. This is a calling that a young person can be absolutely sure that they are called to. But it is also one of the most difficult pursuits a young person can have to be on the pathway to purity. Can you open your Bibles to Psalm 119 uh, verses 9 to 16? The title of today's message is Scripture, the Pathway to Purity. And although the path is not easy, we have some key principles set before us in this passage to help us on our pathway to purity. Uh, it should be easy to find. If you just go to your middle of your Bible, you turn about a little bit to the left, you uh, middle and a little bit to the left, you, you get pretty close to Psalm 119. Uh, and, and as it is the biggest chapter in the Bible. And so Psalm 119, as you know, has 22 stanzas. Uh, each stanza represents a letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Each stanza has eight lines, and then each line then also begins with the same letter. And we miss out on seeing this in our English or Norwegian Bibles. I'm not sure whatever Bible you're looking at. I'm not sure how it's set up in yours. But we, we do get a clue as each stanza has a letter. And so Psalm 119 verse 1 has the word Aleph at the start. And our section that we're going through has bet. Aleph, bet. Aleph, bet. Our alphabet, get it? Right? Okay. <laughs> so, well, and so Psalm 119 was likely written by either David, Daniel, or Ezra. Uh, so we'll refer to the writer as the psalmist. And this psalm is a Torah psalm, meaning it's all about the Word of God. And John 15, 3 says, uh, Jesus says, Already you are clean because of the word that I've spoken to you. And there's no other instrument in the Christian life, uh, Steve Lawson says, that will sanctify you like the holy word of God. And you'll see this throughout the psalm. Eight different terms referring to scripture in some way. We have law, testimonies, precepts, statutes, commandments, judgments, word, ordinances. And so this is the clear focus in this psalm, the word of God. And in a conference on the doctrine of Scripture, this is a great psalm to be in. And so we begin our study in Bet today. So Psalm 119, verses 9 to 16. And we'll split it into three parts. First, a scriptural question. And that is uh, the first part of verse 9. The second part is a scriptural answer. And that's in the second part of verse 9. And then finally, scriptural practical keys. And that's in verses from verses 10 to 16. And that's where we'll look at seven practical applications from these verses to help us on our pathway to purity. And we'll spend half our time on the first two points. Uh, so verse 9 and the last half of our time on the seven practical points. So verses 10 to 16. Uh, so we begin with a scriptural question. In verse 9, the first half, which says, How can a young man keep his way pure. Even when one has the desire for moral purity, there are many things that make it difficult for a young man to cleanse his way. 
One commentator gives the following list. Youthful energy and sense of carelessness, the lack of life wisdom, the desire for and gaining of independence, physical and sexual maturity that may run ahead of spiritual and moral maturity, money and the freedom it brings, young women or men who may knowingly or unknowingly encourage moral impurity, the spirit of the age that both expects and promotes moral uncleanness for young people, the desire to be accepted by peers who face the same challenges. So, what is the solution? How can we? What does the psalmist give as a solution to fight the flesh, the world, and the demonic powers? How can we keep our way pure? Verse 9 continues, and it says, By guarding it according to your word. This is the scriptural answer. This is the key. This is the point of today's message. It's to understand this by guarding it according to your word. This might sound strange, uh, but it reminds me of a quote uh, from the Lord of the Rings. Being that I'm from New Zealand, I, I feel like a Lord of the Rings quote is necessary. When, uh, when the Lord of Rivendell, the elf ruler, was explaining that the ring must be taken deep into Mordor and cast back into the fiery chasm from whence it came. He said that one of those in the fellowship must do this. Understanding the danger, risk, effort, pain and difficulty that journey would be, one of the men, Boromir, says this, One does not simply walk into Mordor. And here the psalmist has a similar view. One does not simply walk into a pure life. Or to be more clear, one does not simply casually stroll into a pure life as though it was a relaxing trip around your local park. Meaning, a life of purity does not happen accidentally. One does not simply fall into a morally upright life. Although we do not need to work for our justification to become a Christian, it is essential we know that, that is very important, that we do not work for our justification to become a Christian, but our sanctification, our Christian living, once we have become a Christian, requires effort. Ephesians 2 uh, verses 8 to 9 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing, it is the gift of God not a result of work, so that no one may boast. This is the gospel, and we must understand this. But the very next verse in Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. This is an active, perseverant, concentrated, righteous walking. And this should not discourage us. This shouldn't make us throw away the Christian life because it will be difficult. Instead, we should be asking questions like this. How can a young man keep his way pure? And we should be looking for answers from God's word. And the second part of verse 9 gives that scriptural answer, which says, by guarding it according to your word. That's the key phrase of this whole, of this whole section. By guarding it, by keeping it. So the first point was the scriptural question and more specifically how can you keep your way pure that was in the first part of verse 9 how do and the world does not ask this question the world does not ask um, how to keep your way pure what does the world ask or oh, how to have fun how to live it up how not to be left out the world doesn't care about purity uh, YouTube and TikTok creators do not care about purity and many spend six hours a day wasted on these things. And the Lord's expectation for us is that we would be holy as He is holy, as 1 Peter 1 says, verse 15. And this is God's expectation. It's not an option. Uh, we, if we are saved, then we would have a desire to seek Him. And then the scriptural answer comes, second part of verse 9. And there is only one primary answer. And that's by keeping God's word, by guarding God's word, by taking heed of God's word, by, to, by paying attention to God's word. You, you do not look for counsel solely from others, you look to the word of God. Yes, there's secondary things that can help us on the pathway to purity, uh, avoiding bad company, which can corrupt good morals. Uh, be wise with who you hang out with, be wise with the places you hang out with guarding your eyes, 
But the primary means of living a righteous life is that one must be in Christ and one must have the Holy Spirit dwelling within them and one must accept and guard the ministry of the Word of God for your soul. One commentator says it like this, God's Word shows us the standard of purity so we know what is right and what is wrong. God's Word shows us the reasons for purity so we understand the wisdom and goodness of God's commands. God's Word shows us the difficulty of purity and reminds us to be on guard. God's Word shows us the blessings of purity and gives us an incentive to make the necessary sacrifices. God's Word shows us how to be born again, converted, so our inner man may be transformed after the pattern of ultimate purity, Jesus Christ. God's Word shows us the way to be empowered by the Holy Spirit so that one has the spiritual resources to be pure. God's Word is a refuge against temptation, given a way of escape in the season of enticement. God's Word is a light that clears away the deceptive fog of seduction and temptation. God's Word is a mirror that helps one to see their spiritual moral condition and thus walk in purity. God's Word gives us wise and simple commands such as to flee youthful lusts in 2 Timothy 2.22. God's Word washes us from impurity and actually cleanses our life in a spiritual sense. God's Word is the key to a renewal of our mind, which in turn is the key to personal, moral, and spiritual transformation. God's Word gives a refuge against condemnation when one has been impure and shows how to repent when they have been impure and how to come back to a pure life. And God's Word shows us how to conduct our life so that we are an encouragement to others in purity. So question for you listening. How do you keep your way pure? By guarding it according to his word. And verses 10 to 16 will help us know how we are to do that. How are we to guard our paths? Now things are going to get very practical now. And Dr. Steve Lawson provides a word for each of these following verses to help us see the ways we are to guard our ways, guard our lives according to God's word. So I want to follow a similar pattern with some slight alterations. Um, so there are seven verses left in bet. Each of these verses can be summarized by one word. So we have seven words, seven words that will help us and seven different keys to application of guarding your path according to God's word. So the first key is devoting, and that's in verse 10. Verse 10, which says, With my whole heart I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. I seek you. The word of God is a means to an end. There is a pursuit of him, a seeking after God. And verse 10 says, With my whole heart I seek you. The Bible is not primarily there for us to win arguments. It is a means in which we might know God. And it's the only way in which we can know God infallibly. Uh, if there is not this whole heart love, this whole heart desire to seek the Lord, then you will not understand that the commandments are there for your good. You'll quickly become a legalist and feel as though the commands are there for you to earn God's favor. They are not. John 14, 15 says, If you love me, you'll obey my commandments. And legalism is a trying to earn your salvation, a trying to follow what God says in order to be good enough for heaven. Legalism says by doing good works or by obeying the law, a person earns and merits salvation. Legalism will not keep a young man pure. Legalism will not give you the strength to live a pure life. Legalism is an enemy of the gospel. The gospel which says that you are saved by trusting in what Christ has said and done. By repenting of your sins and entrusting your life to Christ, He will then create in you a new heart, a heart that loves God and a heart that longs to do what He says. Not because it would save you or, uh, to do what He says, but because you are saved and you understand that living a sinful life will not bring you joy. Rather, God, who knows you completely, has commanded us to live in a way that will give Him the most glory and give us the most joy. And this verse shows that clearly, it begins by saying, with my whole heart I seek you. As the greatest commandment says, love your Lord with all your heart and with all your mind, soul and strength. How can you obey in a way that pleases Him? 
in a way that's not legalism? Well, only if you truly love him. And I do not listen to my wife just to try and earn her love. I know that she loves me and I love her. And so that's why I listen to her. Because I know it brings her joy and it's often for my own good too. And so we are to follow God out of love for him. Otherwise, it's just following rules. And then once we know we are saved, once we know he's on our side, once we know that he knows what is best for us, once we know we no longer need to strive for salvation, once we can honestly say, with my whole heart I seek you, then we can pray. And verse 10 says, let me not wander from your commandments. This is an important prayer for all of us. He feels the temptation to wander. Although life is going in a, in a general direction of commitment to the Lord, he understands that even the most godly man can, can fall. And as the hymn writer says, prone to wander. Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, O oh, take and seal it. Seal it to thy courts above. So you listening to me now, are you saved? Have you repented of your sins? Is Jesus Christ your Lord? Do you understand that if you have not accepted Christ as your Savior, you will die in your sins? Pray that He would forgive you, that He would take out your heart of stone and put in a heart of flesh, a heart that loves Him fully, and then ask Him to help you not wander from His commandments. And so the second key here is storing. In verse 11, storing. Verse 11, it says, I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Stored your word up. What does that mean? What is he doing? He is storing it up. Think of a time that you've stored something up in your house. Uh, we couldn't believe how much firewood we needed last winter to keep warm. I don't know what it's like where you are in your part of the world. Uh, in between Norway and New Zealand, I'm sure you're somewhere there. <laughs> uh, but here in Norway, it gets cold in winter. And so we bought what we thought was a lot of firewood. And we got through about half of it before December. And that's bad. Oh, uh, yeah, that's really bad. <laughs> And so we had to buy a lot more throughout the winter. But the stuff that we did have, we stored it up in our basement. And it was kept there for when we needed it. But the word stored is much more than just keeping for when you need it. It has the idea of storing up a treasure, something precious. It's the idea of, of keeping something of great value, like gold or diamonds, safe. It's locked away securely and daily looked over, making sure that none of it is lost. And another way to say it is hidden. The psalmist has hidden God's word in his heart. So how do we store up the word or hide the word in our heart? We memorize it. And that is difficult. If you want to keep your way pure, if you want to guide your way according to God's word, then you must memorize it. And memorizing it with the purpose of it giving us strength to live, a devo live devoted to the Lord. Have you tried to memorize scripture, a verse, paragraph, a chapter, a book? It's hard. It's really hard. And thankfully, the psalmist gives us motivation why we should do this extremely difficult thing. So why? Why should we memorize? Verse 11b says, that I might not sin against you. There is an extremely good reason presented why we should memorize the Bible. That it would be more difficult to sin against the Lord. All sin is ultimately against the Lord. And if we love the Lord as we talked about in verse 10 with all our heart, then we would hate sinning against Him. And a way to sin less against the Lord is to memorize His word with the purpose that it transforms us. Memorizing leads one to living more faithfully to the Lord. So two questions for you again. First, is it easy for you to sin? And second, how much of God's word have you stored up in your heart? On a conference about the doctrine of scripture, we must challenge ourselves with these questions. I understand that it's hard, 
But three to six hours a day on social media, watching Netflix, on YouTube, playing video games, whatever, shows that it's not due to a lack of time we don't memorize. Memorizing is hard. I'm a grade four teacher at a school, and I understand how technology has completely messed up our attention spans for our memories. And it does not seem worth the time and effort it takes to memorize the Bible. And I'm telling you, it is. The Lord is telling you, it is. It is worth it. The psalmist is saying that his reasoning why he has stored God's word up in his heart is that he might not sin against God. Spending time and effort on memorizing his word stores his word in your heart, which in turn, in turn affects your thinking, your feelings and your choices, which then helps you not to sin. And because it is difficult, my wife and I have aimed to make it easier for our church. Uh, we don't have the advantage of having the Psalms in acrostic format with a song tuned to it. So memorizing Psalm 119 is a lot harder for us than it is for a Hebrew speaker. My wife has made a song to help churches memorize 1 John 1, Fyrste Johannes Kapitel N in Norwegian. So each week we post in our church app an audio recording of a verse from 1 John chapter 1. And there are 10 verses, so it will take about two and a bit months. And it is a Norwegian version, so there's no excuses that, ah, oh, it's in English, it will be too difficult for me and my Norwegian kids. Nope, Norwegian, and it's in song format, so it's easier to remember, and we can learn it together. And we have made it clear that they do not have to memorize this 1 John chapter 1, that they can do their own memorizing plan if they want, just like... Uh, just like memorizing 1 John 1 in Norwegian probably is not helpful for most of you listening to me today. So instead, foc and instead focus on verses that will help one's specific situation. And that's what I encourage you to do. Find verses that will help you in your specific situation. But I encourage you to try something. You go, go onto Apple Music or Spotify or whatever you use and type in fighter versus songs. And that's from children desiring God. And download them and listen to them in your car. Stick Bible verses on your mirror. Do whatever you can that will work. Uh, because I believe you'll be blessed by storing the word up in your heart that you might not sin against God. So the first scriptural key to being on the path to purity is devoting yourself to the Lord with your whole heart. Being saved and willing to live for Him and not yourself. And the second key is storing your word, storing the word in your heart that you might not sin against him. And the rest of the points will be a, a bit quicker. So the first key to guarding your path is submitting. In verse 12, it says, Blessed are you, O Lord, teach me your statutes. The psalmist understands that he's the learner and God is the teacher. And the curriculum, the instructions are the word of God. And he is the student. He, as the student, must submit himself to the word. God is a teacher worthy to be praised. He says, Blessed are you, O Lord. And the psalmist is a student willing to learn from the greatest teacher. Teach me your statutes. Pastor and Dr. Daniel from our very own Norway has a message at this conference where he goes through the inherency and infallibility of the word of God and why you should trust and obey it. And so because his word is infallible and essential, and because it is the word the Lord teaches us, what he says must be heard, it must be understood, and it must be accepted, must be obeyed, it must be followed. It's a question. Are you a good student? Are you one who's willing and eager to find the answers the Lord has in his word and to obey them? We are not to look above the word as it's judged. We are to submit ourselves to it and say, Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. The fourth key is speaking. And that's in verse 13, which says, With my lips I declare all the rules of your mouth. What he has learned, what the psalmist has learned from the Lord in verse 12, he then says here in verse 13 that he proclaims it to others. He speaks the word of God. And our whole church service is dedicated to this at Son of Fjord Evangelical Church. We read the word, we pray the word, we preach the word, we sing the word, we listen to the word. And we, in doing all these things, we obey the word. And when you speak the word, 
your own conscience then gets bound to keep it. The more you speak about what's in the Bible, the more you would strive to obey it. It is a dangerous place to be a silent, secret Christian. And I know that when I preach, even now that my own conscience holds me accountable, uh, that I would follow what I'm saying, that I too am repenting when I fail. I know my wife and my kids listen to me each Sunday I preach, and so I have witnesses to strengthen me to do as I preach. Preach. I have a church family that holds me accountable. And the more you teach and say the truths, the more it binds to our conscience. And it's not only the preaching on Sunday, which many of you listening may not do. It's also raising your children. Uh, we parents who are called to teach our children, raising them in the instruction of the Lord, speaking His word to them. It is also speaking to your neighbors. Your neighbors will very likely call you out on any hypocrisy they see. Do you share the word of God with your spouse, with your family, with your church, with your neighbors, with your colleagues? This is a grace to you in keeping the word to help us to follow it and help, help us to value it. You speak and teach the word to others. So we had devoting, storing, speaking, oh sorry, devoting, storing, submitting, speaking. And the fifth scriptural key to guarding your life according to God's word is delighting. Verse 14, in the way of your testimonies, I delight as much as in all riches. This is a challenging verse. One that we must carefully examine ourselves. There is a rejoicing in the word, a delighting in the word, but it's much more than that. There is no material or financial gain that the psalmist could have that compares to the joy he has in his God. Are you tempted by shopping therapy, by retail therapy, uh, the act of buying special things for yourself in order to feel better when you're unhappy? Go down to the local mall and look around. Oh, I don't need that, but I'll buy it. Make me feel good. Ten years ago, when I went through John Piper's Roman series here in Norway, on my hour and a half commute to Norwegian class and back, I remember him saying in Ro about Romans 8, 32, that that was a promise he would not exchange for all that gold and silver piled up to the stars. And that was mind-blowing. And it would be a good verse for you to memorize if you haven't. He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Would you trade that promise for a million dollars? You know what this promise means, right? That God will not withhold what is best from us. If God gave us the most important and precious thing to us, His Son, Jesus Christ, who bore the wrath due us in His body on the cross, He would not withhold anything else from me that would be for my best. Not what I think is best. We've just had our fourth child, and so um, our five-seater car doesn't, it doesn't fit us all now. Uh, so I think that a bigger vehicle is what's best for me. But the Lord knows what is best. And so his testimony, his word is of far greater value than all riches. And I already know that if I was rich, it would not go well. And I'm pretty sure the Lord knows that too. Well, I guess I live in Norway, so I am rich, <laughs> pretty much. Uh, but I do relate to the words of Agur in Proverbs 30, verses 7 to 9, which says, Two things I ask of you, deny them not to me before I died. First, remove far from me falsehood and lying, and give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is needful for me. Lest I be full and deny you and say, Who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and profane the name of my God. And so God has given me, since I am a Christian, what I need most for my soul. And He's given you, if you are a Christian, what you need for your soul. And I wouldn't trade that, trade that for any amount of money. And if this was truly believed by us, 
I think it would transform our lives, our families, our church, our churches, our communities we are a part of. Test yourself now. If I said I would give you, this random Kiwi guy in Norway would give you uh, $100 for every verse you memorize in the Bible, and you have a month to do that, how many do you think you could memorize? What about if I offered $1,000 per verse, you have a month to memorize as many as you can, how many could you get? I like how Austin Duncan says it. He says, you would probably begin with John 11.35, Jesus wept. Uh, but I'm sure you'll work your way even to the big long ones. Do you delight, rejoice, love the word of God as much as in all riches? Or is money and material things more important? What would your family say? Would they say that you value the word of God Above all riches? How much money would you give for your family to have the word of God memorized? Well, can I make a suggestion as something you could consider? Maybe you pay your kids to memorize the scripture. Oh, I can hear it now. Oh, but then they're just doing it for the money. Well, yeah, maybe, maybe they are. But if you understand the value of scripture, you will know what a precious gift you are giving them. And I think you would find it worth every single cent. Uh, I would offer to pay, uh, but that would defeat the point of seeing if you are valuing the scripture more than money. So I can't take that learning experience from you. So if you get an email from, that, from a random Kiwi saying that he's going to offer to pay you for all the verses you and your family memorize, it's not from me. It's fake. <laughs> uh, Charles Spurgeon's grandmother promised him a penny. So that's about 12 Norwegian Cronus. So that's about one US dollar for every Isaac Watts hymn he could memorize. And <laughs> due to his photographic memory, she had to half the price, the 50 cents, and then lower the price again in fear that he would bankrupt her. And it wasn't until years later, Charles Spurgeon felt the very real blessing of having so many hymns memorized. How much greater to have the infallible word of God memorized. There is a song by citizens called, I am living in the land of death, which has these lines in it. But I feel alive with a life that's not mine. Your law is a stream in this wasteland, my lifeline. So much more than precious gold are your promises, my Lord. By them is your servant warned, and in keeping them, great reward. Value the word of God more than all riches. Two left. The sixth key is meditating. In verse, in verse 6, uh, oh sorry, in verse uh, 15, it says, I will meditate on your precepts, fix my eyes on your ways. You meditate, you recall it, you fix your eyes upon it. Meditate means thinking long and hard on its meaning and wondering how to apply it to your wife, life. Working through how to apply it to your life. And this is far easier to do when you are in the process of memorizing, as you go throughout your day thinking on the verses and their connection to you. We use this saying in Norwegian, uh, and, and we use it in English too, it's to chew on. And the word was used for cows chewing on a big chunk of grass over and over until it, until it gets all the drops of nutrition from it, every single last one bit. So we should fix our eyes on the Word of God. We should chew on it. We should meditate on it. And so we have devoting, storing, submitting, speaking, delighting, meditating. And our seventh and final scriptural key to guarding your life according to God's Word is remembering. Verse 16, it says, I will delight in your statutes. There's that word, delight again. We had rejoicing, we've got delighting. It's said multiple times, saying how important it is to do this. I will delight in your statutes. I will not forget your word. Constantly in the Bible, God is telling his people to remember his word. Constantly. 
God punishes or disciplines those who forget his word. From Adam and Eve all the way to you and I, we are tempted to forget his word. We dry up of delight, of joy in his word, and so we forget it. We forget God's works of salvation. Forgetting what God has done for us. Believe in lies instead of the Bible. Going after other lovers, other idols rather than Christ. Forgetting God when we are satisfied with temporary things, worldly things. We easily forget. It's a question for you. Have you forgotten His word? Have you forgotten those precious promises that once sustained you? Have you forgotten those precious verses that comforted you in an extremely painful process you were going through? Have you forgotten those verses that gave you peace when you lost a loved one? Have you forgotten the nearness a particular Bible passage gave you when you felt distance from the Lord? Have you forgotten the strength you received when, when you preached His Word to yourself? Have you forgotten when in a blink of a lot, eye, a verse that you've heard many times, uh, it didn't really mean anything to you, but in a blink of an eye, it helped you to see God more as He is? Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless His holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all His benefits who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with a steadfast love and mercy. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who love Him, who are called according to His purpose. And He who did not spare His Son but gave Him up for us all, how will He not also with Him graciously give us all things? Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, for then we know that the testing develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you are made complete, not lacking anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault. It will be given to him. But when he asks, he must believe and not doubt because he who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That man should not think he will receive anything from the Lord. He's a double-minded man and stable in all he does. Salia the man som gick i vandre i gudliga folks råg. Gick i stå på sin rödsväg. Men han som lyst i harrens råg och grunde på hans lov dag och natt. Han ska vara i likt ett träd, plantet vid rännade bäcker. Det ger som fruktet sig tid och dets blad visar det icke. Allt det han gör ska han ha lyckat till. Slikar det icke med det gudliga. Det är lik Agna som vinte kastar bort. Psalm 1. Det som var förbindelsen, det som vi har hört, det som vi har sett med våra ögon, det som vi bär traktet och våra händer rätt och värde och livets ord. Och livet blir uppenbart, vi har sett det och vet nu och förkänner det livet. Det är vi som var hos fader och blir uppenbart för oss. 1 John chapter 1. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again. To a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. To an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled and unfading. Kept in heaven for you, who by God's power, being guarded through faith for our salvation. Ready to be revealed in the last time. Preserve me, O God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my God. I have no good apart from you. As for the saints in the land, they are the excellent ones in whom is all my delight. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy. Blot out my transgression. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before you. Do not forget his word. And most importantly, do not forget the gospel. There is only one perfectly pure man whose way was perfectly pure, whose, was an, whose way was extremely painful, but whose way reaped an eternity of joy to those who believe. The one who not only walked the way, but was called the way, the truth and the life. The pure, perfect God-man, Jesus Christ, 
who came and lived a perfect life, a perfect pure life, and yet still died a brutal death on a cross. Not for the pure, but for the ungodly. Although he was pure, although he knew no sin, he became sin for us that we in him might become the righteousness of God. He bore the wrath for sinners like you and I. And if we understand that we are not pure and that we need purifying and that, we, and that if we repent and believe unto him, we would be saved. We are then declared righteous. We are justified, meaning that although we still sin, God the Father would look to us and see not our sin, but see the pure, perfect Son, Jesus Christ, always and for all eternity. And then He'll give us strength to live life here on earth as the Holy Spirit reminds us of His Word and as we apply His Word to our lives. That is our sanctification, slowly becoming how God sees us, and repenting when we fail, which we will, and often, and we repent again and again. And He's faithful to forgive again and again. That's our sanctification. And we walk this earth in joy, knowing that one day we will be glorified. That is, all our sin will be dealt with. He would not just see us as pure. But we would actually be pure. Perfectly. We would have finished the race. We would have kept the faith. And we will be as pure as we can be for the rest of eternity. How can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to his word. Oh Father, give us grace, Lord. Help us to understand the value of your word. Oh, Father, the purifying power of Scripture. This book is so important for us. Thank you for all those that sp spoke at this conference. Oh, my heart is full. I am blessed. Thank you for all those that will listen to these messages. I pray that you will bless them. Pray for us here in Norway. We need your help. We need your strength. Thank you for Nahum and his faithfulness. For Teolegi Husa. Oh, I'm so thankful. Thankful that he would think of us in the midst of all his hardship. We ask for healing, Lord. Help him, Lord. Thank you for your grace to us. In Jesus' name. Amen.